Peter 2 verses 13 to 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. I wonder, how do you feel about the idea of submitting to human authorities? When we were planning this sermon series in 1 Peter back in the summer, I had no idea what a live issue this would be for so many of us right now. Again, we're living through a time unlike any I've ever experienced when government restrictions and guidance are affecting all of our lives in a profound way. I mean, just one example of this. Today, Sunday, the 15th of November, we were meant to be meeting back at Avenue Primary School for the first time since March. But instead, because of the new lockdown in England, I'm speaking to you from my shed again. You see, government restrictions are affecting all of our lives as individuals and as a church family. So I ask the question again, how are we meant to feel about that as Christians? How are we meant to respond to that as a church? And you see, our next passage in 1 Peter is just so timely and relevant to these questions. I mean, it's almost as if the God of the universe speaks directly into our lives through his word, things we need to hear. Well, that's because he does do that. And we love him for it. Now, a few words as we begin this time. This sermon is going to focus almost exclusively on the passage in 1 Peter we just had read out to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And if you've got a Bible, it'd be great to have that open in front of you. But we thought to give us a sense of how Christians throughout history have responded to this question of when and how to submit to human authority. In fact, when not to submit to human authority. We've recorded an interview on the Avenue YouTube channel with John Coffey um, looking at some of the key moments in church history. It's called Christians and Political Authority. And it just aims to give us an overview of some of the ways Christians have engaged with this question. I'm really grateful to John for interviewing Um, doing the interview with us and I'd really encourage all of us to have a look at that interview in the coming little while. And then tonight, Sunday night, 15th of November at 5.27pm as part of our Sunday evening Zoom session, there's going to be a time just for questions or comments on both John's interview on church history and indeed on this sermon today, just to think through what this might mean for us. So really encourage everyone to get along to that Zoom session tonight. But for now, let's turn to the letter of 1 Peter. And let's listen to what Peter says to us about submitting to human authorities. Now, first of all, as we always have to do, we need to remember the context of Peter's words here. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 9 of 1 Peter. If you've been with us, you'll know that, that Peter sort of stacks up these four glorious descriptions of the church in verse 9. You are a chosen people, he says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And we spent the last few weeks sort of looking at each of those descriptions in turn. And at the end of verse 9, Peter wants his readers to understand something of the glorious purpose of the church in this world. See, according to Peter here, Avenue, our church family, exists to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's an amazing purpose we have as Christians. But of course, that begs the question, well, what will that look like in practice? What does it look like to live lives that declare the praises of God in this world? And that's what Peter goes on to show us in the rest of his letter. And so as we come to chapter 2 and verse 13, Peter begins by telling us that one vital part of Christians living lives that declare God's praises in this world is by submitting themselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Let me read verses 13 to 14 for us again. Peter writes, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Right. 
Now, at first glance, Peter seems to be describing some sort of idealized government here, where the emperor and the governors work well together, where, where no one ever has to resign or, or leave suddenly, where the governors make sure that those who do wrong are punished and those who do right are commended. Reading those verses, our immediate response might be, well, Peter must have lived through some sort of golden age of government. Under an emperor who was fair and just, it must have been fairly easy for him to write these words. But today, well, it's much more complicated. No one could expect Christians to submit themselves to human authorities today with the sort of leaders we have in this world. Well, if that's our immediate response to Peter's words, I want to say we couldn't be further from the truth. You see, the Roman emperor ruling over Peter and his readers when 1 Peter was written in the mid-AD 60s, was the Emperor Nero. Even if you just know a bit about horrible histories, you'll know Nero was anything but a fair and just ruler. See, by contemporary accounts, Nero was obsessed with power and promoting himself. He had his own mother murdered. And just a few years after Peter would have written these words, Nero embarked on a vicious campaign of persecution of the church following the great fire in Rome in AD 64. Nero had hundreds of Christians brutally murdered, including Peter himself and including the Apostle Paul too. See, that is what makes Peter's words here so shocking. See, Peter isn't just referring to how Christians should respond to a government that is sympathetic to them. See, Peter's telling his readers here, submit yourselves to human authorities who do not share your faith, to human authorities who do not even share your values. See, yes, you are foreigners and exiles in this world, but you're still commanded by God to submit to human authorities. And notice Peter claims divine authority for all this. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Or verse 15, it is God's will that you do this. So make no mistake, these would have been shocking words for Peter's first readers to hear, just as they are shocking words for us to hear today. And we need to ask the question, well, why? Why should we submit to human authorities even when they are hostile or indifferent to Christians? Well, I think Peter gives us two powerful reasons to do this in this passage. Number one, because submission is a powerful act of worship to God. And number two, because submission is a powerful act of witness to this world. Let's look at each of those in turn. First of all, then, submission is a powerful act of worship. I mean, look again at the reason Peter gives his readers for submitting themselves to every human authority. Do this, Peter says, for the Lord's sake. Verse 13. Submit yourself to human authorities out of your worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit out of love for Jesus. See, according to Peter in this letter, Jesus is the ultimate example of submission we have in Scripture. We're going to see more of that next week when Peter turns to address Christian slaves. But for now, just glance ahead to verse 23 of 1 Peter 2. Peter writes this, When they hurled their insults at him, that is Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. See, according to the Apostle John, we love because God first loved us. According to the Apostle Peter, we submit because Jesus first submitted himself for us, leaving us an example to follow. I mean, when you read over the gospel accounts of Jesus' trial and execution, Jesus' submission to unjust human authorities is just so striking there. See, Jesus submitted himself to the Jewish council, to Pontius Pilate, to the Roman soldiers, nailing him to the cross. And the whole time, Jesus could have broken free in an instant. Jesus could have just pulled rank and silenced those unjust rulers forever. But instead, for our sake, 
Jesus submitted himself to those rulers. And we may ask, but how was Jesus able to do that? Well, amazingly, Jesus was able to do that for the same reason Peter tells us to do it. Verse 23, because Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And Jesus calls on us to do the same. Again, I wonder how some of Peter's first readers would have felt when they heard Peter's letter read out to them. I wonder if their first reaction was just, Peter, this just doesn't sound fair. Are you saying that God is somehow fine with the way Nero was treating us? Are you saying that God sort of doesn't care about Nero's oppression and abuse of power? Peter, doesn't God care about justice? Well, it turns out a few verses later, in verse 23, Peter shows us God actually cares a lot about justice. When Peter urges his readers to submit themselves to human authorities, he tells them to do that by trusting in God as the one who will judge those human authorities. Verse 23 reminds us, God will judge every human leader for what they have done, both good and bad. God is the judge of the whole earth and he will make sure that justice is done in the end. And that is why we are able to submit to him. See, as far as we know, the Emperor Nero never repented of his atrocities or corruption before he took his own life. And if that is the case, well, God has judged him for those atrocities and that corruption. See, in this life, Nero would have looked like a powerful and impressive ruler, while Peter and the Christians he's writing to would have looked weak and unimpressive. But in eternity, it is Peter and his Christian readers who have been welcomed and blessed by the God of the universe. Whereas Nero, on the other hand, is being judged for the terrible pain he caused other people in this world. Peter urges his readers, submit yourselves to human authority as an act of worship to the God of grace. And remember, God always judges justly. And you can trust him to ensure that justice will be done in the end. See, according to Peter here, submission is an act of worship. Now, we might ask the question, well, is submitting to human authorities the only way Christians can worship God? I mean, surely there are times when Christians should refuse to submit to human authorities. And the answer to that is, yes, there are. In the Bible, we get many examples where God's people chose to disobey human authorities and their disobedience was also an act of worship. So just a few examples. In Exodus chapter 1, the Hebrew midwives refused to murder Hebrew baby boys when they were commanded to by Pharaoh because they loved God. In Daniel chapter 3, the Jewish exiles Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to worship the image of gold set up by Nebuchadnezzar because they worshipped God. And in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself keeps praying to God instead of the king as an act of worship to God. And he gets into terrible trouble for it, thrown into a den of lions. Or then you fast forward to the New Testament. And just listen to a younger Peter speak to the Jewish Sanhedrin when the Jewish rulers command Peter and the other apostles to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 5 verse 29, Peter says this, We must obey God rather than human beings. Now we might ask the question, how do you reconcile the Peter of Acts chapter 5 with the Peter of 1 Peter chapter 2? Is this just another example of that sort of young radical who sort of becomes a bit more conservative or even right wing as he gets older? Well, no, I don't think that's the case. See, the principle throughout all these biblical passages is this. Submit to human authorities except when you're commanded to sin. We should submit to human authorities except when we're commanded to sin. In fact, in verse 17, 
Peter gives us a brilliant summary of how Christians should relate in a healthy way to the people around us in this world. Just look at verse 17 of 1 Peter 2 here. Verse 17 begins, show proper respect to everyone or literally honour everyone. And when Peter says everyone, he means everyone. He's not just telling us to honour fellow believers. We're called to treat all people with honour and respect as people created in God's image and precious to him. And the next phrase, love the family of believers. See, following on from that, Peter says it's not enough just to honour other Christians. Peter calls on us to love them. They are your family, says Peter. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. So love them, serve them, pray for them, seek to help them. And then the third statement in verse 17, fear God. See, what Peter's saying there is that God is the only person we should fear in this world. Don't fear anyone else. Don't worship anyone else or anything else. God alone is worthy of our worship. So worship him alone. And then Peter finishes the verse. Honour the emperor. Notice, don't fear him. Don't worship him. Honour him. Give him the respect his position deserves, but don't imagine he's greater than he actually is. I mean, it's really striking how Peter ends verse 17 here. Basically says the emperor is ultimately on the same level as everyone else. That phrase, honour the emperor, is the same word as he used at the beginning, honour everyone. Now, an emperor like Nero would have claimed to be a god, Just as their leaders today, he wanted to demand sort of unquestioning obedience and support from people. But Peter's closing words in verse 17 is, Honour your leaders just as you should honour everyone else. Don't worship them. Don't fear them. Honour them as part of your worship of the God of grace. Now, you may have been hearing all this from 1 Peter today, but we just can't read a passage like this in our current situation without asking, well, what does this passage say to us about the world we're living in? What should our attitude be towards our current government? Or more specifically, what should our attitude be towards the government restrictions on all our lives in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? What does this passage say to us? Again, we are living through a remarkable period of history and we're all feeling the costs of the current restrictions on our lives and I think a really important thing is we need to be honest about that with ourselves and with one another we need to be able to talk openly about the impact restrictions are having on us we shouldn't just pretend that everything is fine because it isn't we should be talking with and praying for one another during this difficult season but just because it's hard and costly to live the restricted lives we're all living today doesn't give us the permission from God to reject or ignore those restrictions. Remember the principle we get from the Bible. Submit to human authorities except when you're commanded to sin. Now for what it's worth, I don't believe the current government restrictions are commanding us to sin. They're hugely disruptive of all our lives as individuals, as families, as a church family. It is costly for us to abide by them. And it's right for us to ask questions and scrutinise the thinking behind those restrictions. But it seems clear to me the restrictions have been put in place not as a command to sin or primarily to stop us meeting together or to go against God's word. Now, these restrictions have been put into place in order to protect people from a deadly virus, in particular those people most vulnerable to it, and to protect our health service and stop it being overwhelmed. And as a result, I don't believe that by submitting to these restrictions, Christians are sinning. Instead, I think we're all experiencing something of the cost and sacrifice that Peter's original readers would have been all too familiar with. The costs and sacrifices that always come when we submit for the Lord's sake. 
See, often in my life, for, for a middle-class Christian like me, it's never felt very costly to submit to human authorities. I've read this bit of 1 Peter before, and it's never really challenged me. But right now in my life, submitting to human authorities really does feel costly. It impacts my life. And as a result, I think this bit of 1 Peter has come alive for me in ways it hasn't before. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. That is a powerful act of worship. Why? Because it costs us something. Because it's hard. Because we need God's help to be able to do it. Submission is a powerful act of worship, Peter tells us. And alongside that, submission is also a powerful act of witness. Peter makes that clear in verse 15. Let me read that aloud for us. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So why should Christians submit to human authorities? Well, Peter tells us here, do it for the sake of your witness to the world. Again, look back at verse 12 of 1 Peter 2. According to Peter, there will always be people in this world ready to accuse Christians of doing wrong. People who reject God and who reject the gospel, and they'll be looking for evidence to dismiss or discredit the Christian message as something sort of mindless, harmful, even evil. And how does Peter tell his readers to respond to those people? Well, look at verse 15 again. He doesn't tell them to engage them in a debate or to argue with them about their wrong ideas. Before any of that can happen, Peter tells his readers, be known for doing good in the places you live. Live as good citizens by submitting to human authorities and you will silence the accusations of unbelievers. Again, I think this, this has so much to say to us today in our situation. I mean, during the season we're all living through, Christians shouldn't be seen as living as if we are above the law, as if because of Jesus, we're free to do whatever we want. We don't have to listen to human authorities. I mean, look back at verse 16. There Peter says that, yes, Christians are free people, but we do not use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. Instead, Christians should be known by our commitment to do good in the places we live. And in this, I think verse 15 helps us see something important about what Peter means by submission. Because again, we first hear that word submission, it, it just sounds very passive. But in fact, Peter is calling on Christians to take an active role in their communities. See, submission to human authorities doesn't just mean obey the law or stay out of trouble. No, submission to human authorities for the Lord's sake is all about doing good in this world, wherever God has placed us. It's about loving the people around us, even when they reject us. It's about Christians asking the question, where are the people in need? And then asking the follow-up question, well, how might God use me? How might God use us to meet those needs? And I want to invite us all to be asking those questions in the coming weeks. Where are the people in need around us? Now, there could be people you don't know personally. People without food or other essentials in this city or in this world. How might God use us to help them? Well, we can donate food to a food bank like the ones run by open hands across our city. We can pray for the work of, of Christian organisations working with vulnerable people. Organisations like Safe Families or Sapphires. And, and think about ways we can get involved practically. We can support the work of groups working in poorer parts of the, of the world. Groups like Tear Fund and Compassion. See, it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Maybe the people in need around us are the, the people on your street. How might God use us to meet those needs? Well, talk to the people on your street as you have opportunity. Listen to them. There are so many lonely, suffering people at the minute. Ask if there are things you can do to help out practically. Pray for your neighbours. And if you have the opportunity, tell them you're praying 
for them. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Or the people in need around you could well be the people in your own church family. And how might God use us to meet those needs? Well, why not go for a walk with someone this coming week? Why not message someone that you're thinking about them? Why not pray for the people in your church family and ask them to pray for you? It's by doing those things, by loving one another well, that we show a watching world that we belong to Jesus, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is changing us. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So I hope we can see today the submission Peter calls us to here. It's not a passive thing. It's a powerful act of worship and it's a powerful act of witness. It's a commitment to love God and to love our neighbour, even when that is costly to us, even when that involves us making big sacrifices in our lives. We opened this time in 1 Peter by asking the question, how do you feel about submitting to human authorities? I suspect for most of us, we'd answer that question by saying, it's hard. We don't find it easy. We're all having to make so many changes and sacrifices in our lives. We'd all rather not make. We're feeling the costs of submission in our lives right now. But I want to finish this time with what I hope is good news. And it's this, the Lord Jesus is committed to helping us and to showing us more of his love for us as we choose to live lives of submission in our world right now. You see, as well as being a powerful act of worship and a powerful act of witness, submission is an opportunity to know and love Jesus more in our lives. And Peter's going to make that point even more clearly when we turn to address Christian slaves in verse 18, a passage we're going to look at next week. But for now, we just need to see something remarkable. According to Peter, it's as we lay down our rights for others. It's as we submit to others for the Lord's sake. It's as we seek to love and serve the people around us, even when that is costly to us. It's in those moments that we get to see Jesus and his loving sacrifice for us all the more clearly. And even better than that, it's in those moments when Jesus draws near to us, when he walks alongside us to help us trust God and love the people around us, even when that is costly. You see, submission to human authorities or to anyone else is never easy. But that is why Peter keeps bringing us to Jesus in this letter. Jesus who suffered for us. Jesus who sacrificed himself for us. Jesus who submitted himself to the Father's will for us, even going to a cross to save us. Jesus knows all about the cost and the sacrifices involved in submission. And the wonderful news I want to leave with us today is Jesus is committed to teaching us and transforming us so that we can learn from him how to submit to others for the Lord's sake as an act of worship and an act of witness. Let me finish by reading again from Peter's amazing portrait of Jesus in verses 23 to 25. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Praise God for the loving submission and sacrifice of Jesus for us. 